go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, there's one in front of you, there should be, um, or if you're in the very front, maybe behind you, uh, you can grab one of those and, uh, and turn to 1 Samuel 10. Also, uh, if you have a smartphone or tablet with the YouVersion Bible app, you can open that to the events section and find uh, the event there as well. First Samuel chapter 10 is where we're at today. My name's Cody. I'm the pastor here at Redemption. It's my privilege to be able to serve you in the scriptures every week, and uh, I'm really enjoying our time in First Samuel. I'm excited about what God has for us here today. Uh, I remember when I was called by God into ministry. It was one of those really distinct moments where the voice of God was very clear uh, in my heart and in my mind. I I heard the gospel message preached and uh, realized that Jesus had died for me. It wasn't just a general message about this guy, Jesus. I had some kind of general knowledge of Jesus, but it was the first time that I had heard the gospel and I realized that's actually for me, that Jesus' death wasn't some thing that just happened in history. It wasn't some fairy tale concept, but that he was substituting himself to pay for my sin. And in that moment, I was saved. And I went forward at the end of this message that was preached and uh, to dedicate my life to the Lord. And as I knelt down to pray, um, God spoke to me in this really internal and powerful way. And it was so powerful in that moment that today, 23 years later, I'm still on the trajectory that God set me on in that moment. And what happened was I knelt down to pray and I felt someone's hand on my back. And in the moment, I knew exactly who it was and I knew what they were doing. It was the youth pastor uh, who had followed me down and he was placing his hand on my back to pray for me, to support me, to spiritually care for me, to care for my soul. And in the moment that he touched me, I felt like the Lord said to me internally, it wasn't an audible voice, it was internally, what he's doing for you, you do for other people. And that's all it was. It was just very simple. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know where it would take me. I had no idea that I would leave Arizona, go to California, and end up in Colorado. I had no idea what God was going to do with my life. But I knew that somehow God wanted me to serve others uh, by his power and by his spirit. And he directs, in that moment, he directed all of my decisions from that moment on even to today. And very soon after that, I began to volunteer and to serve in ministry. But it would actually take seven more years from that moment until that calling was fully realized and I was ordained as a pastor. It took seven years. Now, looking back, that was, it, was, it was a blink of an eye. It was a very short amount of time. But in the moment, in, as I was living through those years, it felt like an eternity. You see, though I was called, I wasn't ready. I needed more from God. And that's what we're looking at here in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And our big idea of 1 Samuel chapter 10 is this, is that a calling by God always includes equipping from God. A calling by God always includes equipping from God. So now t- today we're going to take uh, this chapter a little bit differently than we normally do. We're going to look at it piece by piece uh, instead of reading the entire chapter together. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break it down like this by looking at four spiritual advantages for God's leaders. All right. So the first one, verses one through six, God's prophet. Secondly, verses six, six through eight, God's presence. That, that's not a typo. I'm going to use verse 6 for both, uh, the first two. Uh, Verse 6 is in in the first one and the second one. And then thirdly, uh, excuse me, 6 through 8, God's presence. Then thirdly, 9 through 16, God's power. And then finally, the fourth section, 17 through 27, God's people. All right, let's pray and then we'll jump into this. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. God, we thank you for the opportunity to open it, to hear what you have to say. And we pray that you would speak to us Uh, powerfully. God, that your Holy Spirit would move among us and that you would cause us to sense your calling and to be submitted to your direction. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now today, as we look at how God spiritually equips Saul for his calling, I think it's really important that we don't just read an old story about an old dead guy, but that you realize that God placed this in Scripture on purpose. And then as we look at what is being said about Saul, that there are some significant things that can be said about you and me as well. The truth, the reality is that you have a calling on your life. 
God has crafted you and created you for something specific. God has perfect design for of you for the thing that he wants to do with your life. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, we see that, that God is uh, doing this work in Saul. But what my prayer is, what my hope is, is that you're going to see God's work in you and that you're also going to see how you can participate with the work that he's doing and the leaders that maybe he's placed over you as well. So let's look at these four spiritual advantages for God's leaders. And the first one, God's prophet, verses one through six. Look at verse one. It says this, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Right here, it's, it, it, we're kind of in the middle of a storyline, right? If you were with us last week, you remember that uh, Saul, Saul, Saul and Samuel, they're both S names, it's terrible. Uh, so Saul is trying to find his dad's donkeys and he ends up in the same city that Samuel is in. And uh, Samuel brings him and gives him uh, you know, some dinner and uh, says, hey, you're supposed to be the next king. Uh, and so as they're leaving the city the next day, they walk out to the outskirts of the city and Samuel says, hey, send your servant away along. I've got a message from God for you. And then what does he do next? He pours oil all over him and kisses him. I mean, this is a weird moment, right? Like if, if I said, hey, I've got a message from God for you. And then I poured oil on you and kissed you. You'd be like, whoa, bro. I'm, I don't know. I was going to that kind of church. <laughs> like what is happening? This is a very strange moment, right? This isn't the kind of maybe word or message that he was hoping to receive. All that was on Saul's mind was my dad's donkeys are lost and now something else uh, completely different is happening. But notice why. Notice it says there in verse one, because. See how he says that? Uh, oil, he says, uh, uh, is it, uh, he's poured it on his head because the Lord has anointed you. Uh, is it not because the Lord has anointed you? So, so here this idea, the oil is being poured on him. And, and really the, the thing of this anointing oil is that the oil in itself, it's not magical, but it represents the Lord's anointing. That's what's taking place here. That it's an anointing from God that's taking place. And it's going to actually happen later on in this chapter in verse 10. And we'll, we'll uh, look at it there when we get to it. Now, anoint, maybe when you hear that, the anointing of the Lord or something like that, or, or the Lord's anointing or, or, or that, that kind of phrasing, maybe for you, when you hear that, it's a little bit weird. You kind of get a little bit scared of that. And you're like, what does that mean? Uh, earlier today, when we had a child dedication, I anointed the kids as they were being prayed for by their parents. And so, you know, as we're, as we're talking about this word anoint, really, it's not a, um, it's not actually a religious word. We tend to only use it in religious terms, but it's not actually a religious term. It really just means to put some liquid on something. That, that's really it is. You hopefully anointed your hands with soap when you were in the bathroom, <laughs> right? Like, I am anointing these hands. And as I, you know, well, like you could say it in a super holy voice if you wanted to, but it, that's what you're doing. That, that's really all it is. But it's deeper than that. That Biblically, there is a significant thing that's taking place that's bigger than just some liquid because oil represents the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the anointing of the Lord. It's the presence and power of of the Holy Spirit, and he is vitally important, not just for Saul, not just for the spiritually elite, but for every Christian. First John chapter 2, verse 20 says it like this, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. This is speaking to all Christians, all believers. All believers have an anointing from the Holy One. And even if that maybe gives you, makes you feel weird, like I don't want the anointing. Yes, you do. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He needs to come into your life. He needs to fill you with his presence. And he needs to come upon you in, to, in order to uh, task you for the certain things that he has for your life. For you to fulfill the calling in your life, you're going to need this anointing of the Holy Spirit. David Guzik says it like this. Friends, this is something that is the common property of all Christians. Oh, you can... Uh, go to a Christian bookstore and get books on the anointing, tapes on the anointing, videos on the anointing. And most of them, most of the time, they make it seem like some special higher ground that's just the property of a few unique Christians. The anointing that the Bible talks about, this filling, this empowering of the Holy Spirit, is something that's available to every Christian. You just need to come to God and ask for it. It's just something that you ask the Lord for. It's, a, it's something that's available to every believer. And I would say it's vitally important for every believer 
to experience. You see, the anointing was not so Saul could have some sort of you know, uh, spiritual experience. That wasn't the point of the anointing. It wasn't that Saul needed Holy Ghost goosebumps. That uh, wasn't the point of the anointing. But, but sadly, especially in modern Christianity, modern American Christianity, that's the whole point. I need a feeling. I need to have some sort of thing happen where I, I sense the presence of God. And it's, man, Vince, he picked some good songs today. The, the Spirit's moving. Or I don't really like that song. Uh, it's the, the, Lord, the Lord's not anointing it. We tend to limit the anointing of the, of the Lord to that kind of a thing. I wasn't moved emotionally. Well, you can be moved emotionally by a lot of things, not necessarily the Holy Spirit. There's a lot more going on than just that, than just Holy Ghost goosebumps. You see, Saul needed God's power in order to accomplish God's task. And so this is what this anointing is all about. And so God speaks to him and God says through his prophet, this is what you could expect. This first thing that Saul needs is God's prophet. And that's because he needs to be spoken to by the Lord through the man that God has chosen. And so God speaks to Saul through the prophet and he gives him in verses two through five, three confirmations, actually two through six, three confirmations of what's, uh, what he can expect, that God is going to use this prophetic voice to speak to him. And now God's going to use a prophetic voice to speak to you as well. You need to, you need to expect that God wants to, to meet with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to invest his word into your life. That, that's what we pray happens every single Sunday during this time, that you don't hear me talk to you, but that you hear God talk to you. That, that it's the Lord who meets with you through his word, not just some, some ideas of how to live a better life from some guy. Uh, you know, we could get a bunch of other people who've got better advice than I have to give you. You don't need advice. You need God's word. We need God to speak to us. Lord, would you, would you impart your word into our lives? Would you, by your spirit, cause us to come alive in you. And so he gives him these three different kinds of uh, confirmations. The first one is verse two. Look at verse two. It says this, when you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say to you, the donkeys, which you went to look for have been found. And your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worried about you saying, what shall I do about my son. This is the first confirmation that Saul is going to have. He's going to meet some guys as, he's, as he leaves from uh, Samuel's presence, and he's going to find these guys, and the guys are going to say, hey, we found the donkeys. Here's what God is communicating to Saul through this confirmation. Now, it's confirmation in terms of he's giving him details. Saul is saying, or excuse me, Samuel's saying, Here, this is going to happen, and when it happens, then you can know that what I already told you is going to happen as well. That this whole thing about you becoming king and this oil I've poured on you and saying that God has given you his blessing, this is all, go this is where you can know that this is all from the Lord and not just from me. I'm not just some crazy guy, but that this is from God. I'm going to confirm the word of the Lord. Oh, second, the, one of the other things I, I forgot to mention in, the, in verse one where it says that he poured oil on him and kissed him, it wasn't like, you know, a weird kiss. It was, uh, this is a, a sign of affection uh, from Samuel to say, I'm supporting you. That's what's happening there. He's just saying, I'm supporting you as king. Uh, more than just the, the oil, but he has his own personal backing as well. But here's what's happening with the donkeys. The donkeys have been found, and what God's communicating to Saul in this moment is that, uh, that he's the one who solves your problems. Saul, if you're going to do this right, you're going to need to know that I solve your problems. You don't just figure them out on your own. You don't just go and, and try really hard. I mean, he tried really hard to find the donkeys, and they were so elusive, they, he couldn't find them. He, he needed God to move on his behalf. And so as the donkeys are found, that's what's being communicated. Saul, you can trust me to solve your problems. The second confirmation, verse 3. Is, is here where he says, then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There are three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. And so here's this second confirmation, this second detailed event where there's going to be a certain number of people, they're going to be carrying a certain number of things, and they're going to be going to a certain place. 
And when you see this, when you experience this, you'll know that the Lord is directing your path. And it's another way of confirming that God is saying, this is a way that you can trust me. And what he's communicating to Saul in this moment, this bread will be given to you, is God saying that he's the one who supplies your needs. So I'm not only the one who solves your problems, but I'm the one who supplies your needs. When you need something, come to me. That's where you're going to find this take place. And the third confirmation is what we find in verses 5 and 6. After that, you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with, stringed, with a stringed instrument, tambourine, a flute, a harp, before them and they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. That, that here in verses five through six, he's gonna find a group of prophets and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna be playing some music and then God's Spirit is gonna come upon you. You're not just gonna see it, you're gonna participate. You're gonna jump in and participate with these prophets. Now God is speaking to Saul in this moment that he's the one who imparts the power. That when you need the strength, when you need the power, I'm the one who gives it to you, Saul. There are, there are a number of things that are being communicated to Saul in these uh, confirmations. And this is what we need God to do in our lives as well. There, there may be times when you sense that God is leading you in a certain way, that God is trying to get you to do a certain thing, or maybe somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I think I got a word of the Lord for you, and they, they speak to you and they, they tell you something about your life. Now, here's something that you gotta know with when people do this. If somebody comes to you and they say that they have a word of God from you, if you've never thought of this before, then you should be leery of it right away. I don't, know, I don't know if this is a good thing. Now, Saul, he never thought about being king. Maybe he did, but he didn't seriously think he was gonna be king. He was caught off guard by this whole thing. And so God brings these confirmations so that he'll know that this is something that's gonna take place. You need to expect God to confirm his word. That, that if God is gonna give you a, a supernatural special direction from him, then he's going to confirm it. You see, true faith is never blind faith. God will always make sure that you have more than enough uh, to be confident that you've heard his word. So don't just do it just because it seems right to you or because you want it or because that holy person told you that you should. Expect that the Lord is going to confirm his word to you as he directs your path. So not only does, uh, does Saul get uh, this spiritual advantage of God's prophet being on his side, but he also has God's presence in verses 6 through eight. Now we're going to take verse six and we're going to bring it into verse seven and see what the Lord does in this moment as well. It's God's presence. God's presence that is with him. Verse six, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you'll be, uh, you'll prophesy with him and be turned into another man. Notice verse seven, and let it be when these signs, right, these, these confirmations, these three, three things happen, come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. Now, having a spiritual guide to help Saul and give him direction is great. Having Samuel on his side is a great thing, but it's not enough for him to confidently and continually move ahead in God's direction. Any more than having me as your pastor is going to be enough for you to have a uh, satisfied, healthy Christian life. If, if you're expecting that your entire Christianity is going to be summed up in what happens in this time on Sunday mornings, then you're going to have a very weak and feeble Christianity. This is, this is part of your walking with the Lord. This can't be the totality of your walking with the Lord. Same thing with, with Samuel here and Saul. That Samuel can't be the end all and be all for Saul. That Saul is going to need a personal connection to God and his presence. That if he's going to confidently and continually move ahead in God's direction, he needs the Lord to be with him. And so for Saul to be able to lead well, he's going to need to have the very, need to have the very presence of God with him. Closer than just being generally around, that God's presence is kind of just everywhere, he needs God's specific presence to be with him in a very active and near kind of a way. And, and there, I love what it says there in verse 7 where he says uh, that, that when, when you're in these moments, do as the occasion demands. You see, the specific details of any given situation demand a variety of responses, don't they? 
There are lots of different situations that you find yourself in all the time. And they demand a, a series of different responses. That Saul couldn't have the same response in the first uh, part of this confirmation as he does in the second or the third. He needed to have a different response in a different situation. And, and so too it is with you and with me. That, that it's, it's not just in these things that Saul needs to have this attitude of doing what the occasion commands, but he's being encouraged to submit to God and to trust his leading. That, that living a God-honoring life is going to require courage to follow God's leading moment by moment. That as he leads you into those situations, as he, as he comes to meet with you, as you're going to make that decision, as you're going to go that direction, as you're going to take that step of faith, that you have to trust that God is directing your path. Have you ever had it happen when you, uh, you did something uh, and you stepped out in faith and as you were going, God redirected your path? The thing that you thought was going to happen didn't happen. And you ended up going somewhere else. I know that's happened with me uh, many times. One, one such occasion was when my wife and I first uh, got married. Um, we, uh, we, she had done, uh, gone to Bible college for one year, and we thought it was a good idea for her to uh, be able to go back to Bible college. And so we were married in Arizona, and then we decided, let's move back to Southern California so she can finish up her time at Bible college. And we moved uh, to, to Southern California and uh, got an apartment and got all those things going on, enrolled her in Bible college, and then we realized something. We are poor. We were a young married couple. I didn't have an awesome job or anything like that. We didn't have the money for her to be able to go to Bible college. And so God used that desire within us to move us that direction. But what we thought was going to happen didn't happen. He actually put us somewhere else. We ended up serving at this other church and I ended up going on staff at that church. And, and that's you know, how the Lord directed our path. But many times God is going to direct your path as the occasion demands. You've got to have enough enough uh, uh, courage to follow the Lord in those moments, moment by moment. You see, we can easily reduce our relationship with God to just a contractual agreement, right? I perform my duties, and God, you do your things. Lord, I, I, uh, I didn't say bad words this week. I'm going to need you to go ahead and give me some blessings. I went to church. I listened to the redhead yell about some stuff. <laughs> you know, hook me up this week, Lord. Um, so, you know, the, the thing is, is that we, we tend to reduce our relationship to the, with the Lord like that. And, and yet, the truth is, what matters most isn't God's property. It's God's presence. We tend to want his stuff without wanting him. And, and that's just, that's just a, a crazy, rebellious mentality. Lord, help us to want you, not just your stuff. And he'll, he'll give you the stuff. Just I mean, think, about, think about your own relationship with your own kids. Right? I, I want relationship with them, and they can have all my stuff. They have access to all my things. Um, it's, it's the relationship that matters the most. Deuteronomy 4.29 says it like this, but, but from there you will search again for the Lord your God, and if you search for him with all your heart and soul, you will find him. Notice the, the thrust of this is about relationship with God. It's about his presence being with the people, Matthew 6, 32, Jesus says it like this, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. Focus on relationship with him. Focus on, on getting more of him. Forget about all the stuff. He'll take care of the stuff. The stuff will just fall into place when he's in the right place. You see, the situation that you find yourself in, maybe the problem that you need to solve, the decision you need to make, uh, that, that certain situation, they are all more about God's presence than they are about that thing. The reason God has allowed that into your life, the reason that tension is felt within your soul is because he's drawing you deeper to himself. It's not really about the thing. It's about your relationship with him. You see, apart from God's presence, Saul can be no greater than any other pagan leader in the surrounding region. But with God's presence, he could be a great leader. With God's presence, he could fulfill God's call in a tremendous way. Thirdly, not only God's prophet and God's presence, but the, the third spiritual advantage is God's power in verses 9 through 16. Um, I don't think I read verse 8. He says, verse 8, you shall go down before me to Gilgal and surely I will come down to you and offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. Verse 9, so it was when he had turned back uh, to go from Saul 
excuse me, Samuel, that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Uh, Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. You see, Saul needed a transformation in him so that he could be equal to the task that God had given him. If he was going to do the thing that God called him to do, he couldn't be the same guy that he started off as. He had to actually be changed. He had to be transformed. He had to become somebody totally different, somebody totally new. That, that if, if God is giving you a task to accomplish, it's going to be bigger than you are. It's going to be greater than your capacity to just do it on your own. And notice how this happens. It says, verse 9, as he turned from Samuel, that, that when, when Saul leaves and he actually goes, that's when all of these confirmations happen. That's when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. You see, this new man in verse 6 that came through a new heart in verse 9 was that Samuel uh, was something that Samuel and Saul couldn't give. Samuel couldn't impart this new heart to Saul. He couldn't declare it over him. He couldn't cause a new heart to grow up within Saul. Saul couldn't do it himself. He didn't have enough willpower. He didn't have enough strength and ability. He couldn't just make a New Year's resolution and turn himself into a new man. He had to have something else. He needed the presence and power of God to come upon him to transform him. It was only God's power that could change who he was. That's, that's the message of the gospel. It's only the power of God that can transform people. That, that if you want to experience victory in your life over sin, if you want to be set free from the traps of sin, if you want to live a holy life, if you want to be, be a godly person, you're not going to do it through religious trappings. You're not going to do it by lighting a bunch of candles. You're not going to do it by walking old people across the street. You're not going to do it by adopting a lot of rescue dogs. You're not going to do it by giving a bunch of money. You're not going to do it by serving at some place. You're not going to accomplish it by doing anything because there's no way for you to do it. The only way for you to have the victory that you need over the sin that wants to control you and destroy you The only way that you can be a godly person who lives a godly life is when the blood of Jesus washes over you and makes you clean. It's when the Spirit of God moves into you and causes you to be who you could never be on your own. The gospel is offensive. The gospel says you're not enough. That's that's exactly the opposite of what the world says today. The gospel says you're not enough and you're broken and you'll never make it on your own but God. And that's the glorious part of the gospel. But Jesus stepped into human history to take your place, to to die the death that you deserved, to pour his blood out to purchase you from sin and death. And instead instead of taking the punishment that you deserve, you get the blessing that he deserves. You get adoption as a child. You see, willpower, it can't do it. A good plan isn't going to do it. Nagging your spouse isn't going to do it. The only way to change somebody is for Jesus to move in. That's the only way. There's no other way to to change somebody. Verse 10, it says, When they had come there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he... uh, excuse me, I missed my place, saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets that the people said to one another, what is this uh, that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. You see the focus here in verses 10 through 13, it shifts to one of the three confirmations. Remember, there were those three things that we saw earlier in the chapter that were confirmations, and now we get some details about what happened in the very last one, the third of the three confirmations. And it's this shocking scene that takes place where Saul becomes participating with one or with the prophets of the Lord. Now, this is shocking because Saul wasn't really a spiritual kind of a guy. He was, just, he was a guy that he wasn't necessarily against religious stuff. He wasn't for it either, though. He was just kind of indifferent. If you remember before, 
He was so spiritually disconnected, he didn't even know who Samuel was. The guy who's the prophet over the nation of Israel, who went on an annual circuit around preaching uh, in different cities every year. Uh, Saul lives only five miles away from Samuel, doesn't know who he is. All that Saul would have to do is show up at one feast, one time throughout the year, and he would have heard Samuel preach. He would have known, but he's so disconnected that he doesn't even know who Samuel is. And that guy is now part of the worship team, right? Like this is, this is a crazy thing that's taking place. This is a supernatural move of God that something here significantly is, is happening, that the Holy Spirit has him now participating in this, this prophesying. You see, one of the things that this introduces for us that I want to spend a minute on is the Holy Spirit and his work among his people. That The Holy Spirit basically works in three main ways. And the, the way that the Holy Spirit works is uh, uh, given to us basically around three prepositions that are used in the New Testament about how he works in our lives. The first two are in John chapter 14, verse 17, where Jesus is speaking and he says this. He says, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you. That's the first one, with, and with you now and later will be in you. That's the second one. Those are the two prepositions, these first two prepositions of the Holy Spirit, with and in. The Holy Spirit is with generally everybody. God's presence is uh, one of the things about God is he's omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at all places at one time. And so in a very general way, God is with you. He's with the people down the street. He's with the guy at the car dealership. He's with wherever. Wherever people happen to be right now, God is with everybody. Believer and unbeliever alike, God's presence is with everybody. But notice what Jesus says there, that God will be in you. The Holy Spirit will be in you. This is at the moment of salvation when you recognize Jesus' blood was paid for you and you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life. I'm no longer going to live for myself. I'm going to recognize my sinfulness, ask for his forgiveness, and follow him. At that moment, you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit moves into you. He actually, he, the 1 Corinthians 6, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why we don't worship this building. This isn't the temple. This is a building. You can use it for literally anything. We, we met in parking lots and in you know, business parks and all sorts of things, okay? You can, the church isn't confined to a space. The, the, the temple of God is you when the Holy Spirit moves into you. These are the, but that's only believers. The Holy Spirit isn't in everybody. The, the world tries to say, we're all just children of God. That's not true. That's theologically incorrect. The only children of God are the ones who were adopted into his family. And when that happens, you receive his Holy Spirit. You've got to be a Christian in order to be the child of God. Otherwise, what Jesus says is you're actually a child of Satan bound for hell. The third preposition is set where we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus, again, is speaking, and he tells his disciples this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's our third preposition. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is that third preposition. The Holy Spirit is with everybody generally. He's in only Christians. And then there are some Christians where the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And notice there in that verse, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come upon you and that's how you get the power. The power to do the thing that God's called you to do is when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to equip you for that task. That this is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you want to call it that. This is the, uh, the coming upon of the Holy Spirit. Whatever words you use, that's what this is. And it's something that is vital to life in Christ. But sadly, the vast majority of Christians never experience this. They don't even know what this is. They, they've never even taught this stuff, that there are these different ways that the Holy Spirit interacts with you. And so we live our lives sort of on our own, trying to do our own thing and make our own thing happen and wondering why we're powerless to do it. It's because we need the Holy Spirit. 
We need his presence. We need his power. We need his ability. You see, if you can accomplish the work of God by your own strength and power and wisdom, then you're not doing the work of God. It's, it's got to be his strength. It's got to be his ability. It's got to be his power, his wisdom. We need the Lord to come upon us. And so the Lord empowers believers with the ability to accomplish specific ta- tasks as he assigns them. Skip Heisig says it like this. Do you see it? The Holy Spirit is all over this guy. He has every reason to succeed. He has natural capabilities with his looks, his heritage, with, relationship, uh, with this relationship with his father, with the estimation of himself. He has the power of God. He has the presence of God. He becomes a transformed, a different man. What God has called him to do, God will enable him to do. This is the moment where God enables Saul to actually accomplish the task that God has given him to do. Well, in verse 14, we see that the the story continues as Saul goes home. It says, verse 14, Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, Where did you go? So he said, To look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, tell me, please, what did Samuel, uh, what Samuel said to you? So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. Uh, So Saul's family, they're wondering what's going on. You know, uh, Saul, he says, hey, I spoke with Samuel. He shows up. He's probably still glistening a little bit with this oil. I I mean, I don't know what you think about when you think about anointing with oil, but Old Testament anointing, they open up a jar of oil and pour it all over you. And the way it's described, it's like running down their beard. Like this is, it's not a little drop, okay? There's a lot going on. This is, it's going to take a few days to wash this stuff out. And so Saul's been gone for a while. He says, yeah, I met with the prophet of God. What happened there? You're kind of glowing with some oil. You've been gone for a little while. I heard you were part of the, you know, the worship team now. What is going on? Like what, what's happening with you? Uh, what you participate in this worship service. This is just, it's not like you. And so Saul, he chooses there at the end of verse 16, he chooses not to tell his uncle about the thing about the kingdom. He says, hey, yeah, he told us the donkeys would be found. But we're told, he, he says, he didn't say anything about this whole issue of the kingdom. Now, there could be two reasons why, two, two, as far as I can tell, two things as to why he didn't do this. One, it could be just God-given wisdom. Right? If Saul starts going around saying, I'm the king of Israel, right? He's gonna look like a moron. Like, what? No, you don't you don't declare yourself as king, right? You don't get to do, you can say that you're whatever you want, but that doesn't mean it's true. Uh, that something else has to take place. So this could just be God-given wisdom. He's just not gonna, he's gonna wait until God recognizes him publicly and then he'll take that office. Or secondly, this could also be spiritual warfare. This could be a time when, you know, when God has moved in this powerful and amazing way in Saul's life, and now he's embarrassed about it. Now he's unsure about it. Now he feels foolish about it. And he's like, I, just, I don't really want to talk about the things that God's doing in my life because I just feel uneasy and I feel weird about it. It could be a mixture of, all, of both of these things. But, but at any rate, he doesn't decide to tell his dad. And I think that a lot of times we, uh, or his, his uncle, I think a lot of times we end up in a similar situation where God moves in our lives and we can easily feel like we're the foolish one. We can easily feel like maybe I've lost my mind. Maybe I'm the crazy one. But the truth is God is at work and you can trust him to direct your path. And, and, and uh, that's what we see God doing here with Saul. All right, so fourthly, not only do we see God's prophet, his presence, his power, but the fourth spiritual advantage that uh, God gives to Saul is God's people, God's very own people. So let's read verse 17. It says this, Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the, ki- of the Egyptians and from all the kingdoms and from those who oppressed you, but you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, no, set, us, uh, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes, by your clans. And when Samuel had uh, caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he had 
caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families. The family of Matri was chosen, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Sometime later, uh, after Saul goes home, we see that Samuel calls everybody together uh, in order to present Saul as the king. But as any uh, you know, prophet of the Lord, he first preaches a sermon to them about God's faithfulness and their rebellion. Hey, I'm not just going to give you your king. I'm going to remind you of what the Lord has to say. God was with you. God was the substance of everything that you needed. Notice the, the, the message there in verse 18. God was the one that brought them out of Egypt. God was the one that delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians. God delivered them from the other kingdoms that were around. God was the one who delivered them from anybody who oppressed them. Every step of the way, God had their provision, their protection, uh, everything that they needed. God was leading them. And, and yet, they didn't want the substance of the Lord. They wanted the image of a man. And so this is what God is going to do. And that's where he says, today you rejected your God. And so God says, I'll give you the king that you are asking for. And Samuel and Saul already know God's choice. They're already convinced of it, but everybody else doesn't. And they need to know that it's the Lord who is doing this, that it's not just uh, something that is a man-made appointment. You know, Samuel just rolls the dice and picks some guy, or he's like, hey, that's a guy I think should do a good job. It's not Samuel's choice. It's not Samuel's decision. And also, Saul needs the backing of the people. Saul needs to experience that the people are behind him, helping him with this task that he is given by God to accomplish. And so just like in Joshua chapter 7 when God exposes the sin of Achan, here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, God does the same thing. He, he calls the whole nation together and then he narrows it down to the tribe. It's the tribe of Benjamin. That's where, uh, that's where this, this king is found. And then he narrows it down not just to tribe but down to the clan. It's the group of families that make up this clan like, like you and your cousins and that kind of thing is what this would be like. And then down to the very family, uh, the family of Kish and then the son named Saul. Now when they get to Saul's name, they find out at the end of verse 21 he's not even there. That, that he, they, they can't find him. Look at verse 22. It says this, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Here we see that uh, they, they get to Saul, they find out he's not there, and, and, and what, they ask God, okay, so where's this guy at? And, and God says, he's, oh, he's over there hiding. He's hiding in the equipment. Now, as we look at this, on its surface, it may seem like humility, but in truth, this is false humility. It's not a, hum it's not a humble thing for Saul to hide from this. It's a veiled form of pride. Here's how Warren Wearsby says it. He says, true humility accepts God's will while at the same time depending on God's strength and wisdom. Had Saul been focusing on the glory of God, he would have been present at the assembly and humbly accepting God's call. Then he would have urged the people to pray for him and to follow him as he sought to do the Lord's will. You see, this, was, this hiding, it wasn't humility. It was actually veiled pride. You see, humility, humility is not to think less of yourself. It's to think of yourself less. That you don't consider yourself. That's the concept. He was so self-absorbed that he hid himself away. That, that, this, was, this was the pride of Saul. And, and the people uh, could clearly see that he was their chosen leader. And Samuel confirms it. And so the nation backs him as their king. Long live the king, they shout. And, and so Saul experiences the backing of God's people, one of these spiritual advantages that God gives him. God moves uh, in this. Notice what it says, verse 25. Then Samuel explained the people the behavior, the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up in, before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Uh, this is uh, probably mostly taken from Deuteronomy 17 and God's uh, direction for kings, but perhaps some other things that Samuel had written in there for uh, the way that the king should act. Verse 26, and Saul also went home to Gibeah and valiant men went with him whose hearts 
God had touched. But some rebels said, how can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presence, but he held his peace. You see, God moves on the hearts of the people in general, and they, the nation backs him. But then God moves on the hearts of some specific men. In verse 26, these valiant men, these are going to be sort of like a security detail, and they're going to become the guys that are part of his inner circle, the ones that are closest to him. You see, God's work is bigger than any one person. If it's going to succeed, then others must respond to God's call and support his leader. That as God is raising you up to things, that as God is putting his call in front of your life, that as God is giving you direction, it's got, if it's going to be bigger than you, he's going to need to call other people to support that work alongside of you. But not everyone is going to celebrate with you when you pursue God's will for you. Have you experienced that? Sometimes people, the people that you think should be for you are the ones who are against you. And they start attacking you for the thing that you're doing to try to follow the Lord. So expect opposition sometimes from the craziest of places. That, that there will be those who oppose the work of God. So here's the question I want to ask as we close. What has God called you to? What is the divine direction and purpose he's given for your life? Why do you draw breath in this moment? Why has God given you the life that you have? Why has God given you the influence that you have? Do you know what it is? Are you pursuing what that is? You see, the first and most important spiritual advantage that you need is to be saved. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, then none of these other spiritual advantages are for you. You can access no more of them. The first and most important one is to dedicate your life to Jesus and to follow him, recognizing that his blood was spilled for you. Without salvation, there are no more steps to take. And for some of you, that may be the step that you need to take today to recognize Jesus as your Savior. And some of you, maybe you have no idea what God's made you for because you've been so wrapped up in your own life and your own pursuits and your own things that you, have, you haven't even considered what is God's call, what is God's design for me. And it hasn't even been a question you've asked. You've just been, well, I do my thing and I go I go about my life. And others of you, maybe you know what God's called you to, but you're either passively or actively living in rebellion against it. You know what God's made you for. God's spoken it to you clearly, and, and maybe you've done it in the past, but you're not doing it anymore, or maybe you just haven't ever taken up the mantle to pursue what God's made you for. But at any rate, you're just not doing it. I, I don't know where you're at today in all this, and, and maybe you're not, maybe, you're, maybe everything's good. But, but just in the event that maybe some of us here, we need a moment to say, I need, one of the, uh, I need a come to Jesus moment. I want to give you that opportunity. I want to give you that chance today. And so what we're going to do, we're going to close our service a little bit differently today. Uh, we're going to have the worship team come up. You guys can come up if you're, if you're here. Go ahead and come up, uh, Vince. We're going to have the worship team come up. They're going to play. And, and I want to leave the front here open for you, for, for anyone, whether you need to give your life to Jesus for the first time, whether you need to beg the Lord and say, God, would you tell me what you've made me for because I'm not doing it? Or maybe you're just living in rebellion against the thing God's made you for. I just want to leave, make it available for you to come up as not a way to come to me, but to come to the Lord and, and to, to have a place of meeting with God and, and a place of, of meeting with him. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have that space available for you to do that. So if, if that's you, I want to I encourage you, don't wait in your seat, but come forward before the Lord and ask him, ask him for what you need. He has everything that you need. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, God. Thank you for your love for us, your great word, and we pray that you would help us to pursue you together today. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to follow you in the things that you made us for, that we might glorify you and honor you. We pray together in Jesus' name.